Kevin Milam is the Democratic Alliance's Shadow Minister of Minerals and Energy. W what does that mean, Kevin, for people who aren't that close to politics? So it means I'm the opposite number to the minister. I'm Gwede Mantashe's opposite number, and I hold him accountable. I call him out when I see that he's doing something wrong. I put proposals on the table. I put suggestions on the table. And the Democratic Alliance, as the official opposition, has shadow ministers that, that uh, basically counter every single minister in Cyril Ramaphosa's cabinet. So it should be keeping them to account. We try. We try. Uh, you have looked back at, I asked you just to have a look back over the past few years on Montasha's record because it really doesn't make happy reading. South Africans are now really upset with load shedding, not surprising, it's been going on for a decade and a half, but it's almost like despite the mistakes that Montash makes, he, he lurches from one crisis to the next, much of them self-inflicted. He does not appear to have any, um, any consequences for these really bad decisions that were made. And he himself is immune to, to criticism. You're in politics. What is this about? Well, the, the history of load shedding goes back a long way. I mean, the, the, the crisis that we find ourselves in, ESCOM identified it way back in 1998. Uh, the white paper on energy said that if we didn't build new generation capacity by 2007, we would be in a load shedding crisis or we would be in an electricity crisis. And nothing was done. And then in about 2006, 2007, government suddenly caught a wake up and they took out massive loans from the World Bank to build Madupi and Kusile, neither of which are complete, by the way. Kusile only has one unit out of six operating. Madupi, I think, is at four out of six at the moment. Uh, but the, the, the situation is that Gwede Mantashe has been around for the entire time that this crisis has been with us. Uh, he was the secretary general of the ANC when Madupi and Kusile were being built, and he oversaw Chancellor House acquiring a stake in Hitachi, the uh, boilermakers at the time. And you will recall that uh, there was a lot of corruption and exposure around that. Chancellor House is the ANC's investment arm, and Gwede Mantashe oversaw that. And then since 2019, he's been the Minister of Energy and uh, the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy. Now, Mantashe comes from a coal mining background. He was a unionist, and he was very, very much involved in coal mining. And so he has a, a, a vested interest. He has a constituency that is based in the coal mining sector. His support base comes from the coal mining sector. And it's for this reason that uh, the ANC is finding it difficult to hold him accountable. Because if they do he has got a constituency that might be angry with the ANC and perhaps vote for someone else. Is that how we read this? Exactly. He's got a constituency that numbers in the hundreds of thousands, uh, the coal miners and, and their supporting industries and uh, trades, etc., cetera, that, that support the coal mining industry and all the unions associated so with if it. We read, if, if we read through the timeline uh, that goes back since Mantash, Mantash became the Minister of uh, Minerals and Energy. It, it, there are a few very strong themes here. The one is he wants to create another ESCOM, a, a state-owned uh, electricity provider. Despite ESCOM being such a disaster, he thinks another one uh, will solve our problems. The other one is he wants to create a nuclear uh, build, a little bit like what uh, Zuma was trying to do, and we know that that was fraught with corruption and an easy way, perhaps, to fund a political party that has no other funders. He also wants to promote fossil fuels wherever possible and keep the private sector out. Now, those four were the four themes that came through pretty clearly. If you have a look at his actions over the past three to four years, many of those having exacerbated the power uh, um, problems that South Africa is faced with, and indeed, many of those going flying completely against the view of the president, or what we're hearing from the president in State of the Nation. What are we to make of this as citizens of South Africa? Well, you're, you're absolutely correct. So the, the first issue that we have with uh, Minister Mantashe is 
his overwhelming kind of support for the fossil fuel sector and his reluctance to open the market to renewable energy. We need, to, we need to acknowledge that there is no appetite for investment in fossil fuels. No one, no, no financial institution in the world wants to put money into building coal-fired power plants. It's, it's just not there. The one private coal-fired power plant that was proposed to be built in South Africa is now no longer being built because the finance has been withdrawn. That was at Tulemetse. Uh, we've seen that there's no, no real appetite for investment in nuclear in South Africa. And, and indeed, the, the appetite for nuclear worldwide has declined. The, the biggest users of nuclear in the world uh, as a percentage of, of, of power production are the French. And uh, even there, the availability of their nuclear power in the last two years has declined substantially. Now, they use the exact same technology that we use at Kuburg. Uh, and Kuburg is going through a life extension program at the moment. So moving from fossils to nuclear, um, the other issue that we've got both with fossil fuel and nuclear is the length of time it would take to build those, those new generation plants. In other words, um, to build a nuclear power plant, you're looking at something like 15 years. We've seen with Madupi and Kusile where the initial time frame was seven years. We're now, we're now past 14 and, and neither of them are complete. So th there is a long build time to get them operating and adding electricity to the grid. We need electricity right now. The crisis is immediate. Uh, in fact, the crisis has been, the crisis is 15 years old. Um, and, and we need to address that crisis now if we are going to rescue our economy. So that's the second issue. The third is, well, where do you build these, this new generation capacity in South Africa? ESCOM have come out and said, we don't have the money to build new generation. Andre de Reiter told that to a joint portfolio committee of, of public enterprises and mineral resources and energy a couple of weeks ago. He said, ESCOM doesn't have the finances to build new generation. So we asked him, well, what about the state? Well, the state doesn't have the money to, to build new generation. So it's got to be from outside of the state. So ESCOM 2.0 is, is a non-starter from a financial perspective. There's just no, no time and no money for the state to build. So that means that we've got to bring in new generation from outside of ESCOM. It's got to be independent power producers adding to the grid, which opens up a whole nother problem because our grid capacity is a little bit constrained. And we saw that in the latest bid window that, that was announced last week, where of the, the 6,000 odd gener uh, gigawatts of generation that, that uh, were offered for, for renewable energy, only about 1,000 was, was actually taken up. And the reason for that is because we don't have any offtake capacity on our grid in the Eastern Cape, Western Cape, and Northern Cape, which is where most of our, our wind and solar resources reside. So we've got, we've got sort of a perfect storm that Mantashe is playing in the wrong, on the wrong playing field. He, he's kind of playing in the wrong space and should be playing where he can get more generation as quickly as possible. That's primarily in the renewable space. Obviously, we need to look at a diverse mix of, of electricity supply, but um, we need to add generation as quickly as possible. Is this because he personally perhaps is not exposed to the anger that South Africans, ordinary South Africans are expressing? And, and that really is, uh, we, we've had these conversations in the past about the delusional situation that some people are in when they don't have load shedding. Um, and uh, because of their privileged positions, could it be that, or is there something much deeper here? Is there a is there another agenda at work that we just can't fathom out? Look, I think there is a a, a huge disconnect between Cyril Ramaphosa and his cabinet, and and the people of South Africa, and the experience that they live through every single day with regards to load shedding. I think that they they don't feel it anywhere near the way that the average South African citizen or the average South African business feels it. I mean, you've seen it yourself, how your own uh, business is interrupted when, when load shedding strikes and, and uh, it, it disrupts absolutely everything. Our economy is losing, it's been, there are various estimates, but the, the one that seems to be taken as an average is about 500 million rand per stage of load shedding per day. So if you take that we're at stage six load shedding at the moment, that's 3 billion rand per day 
that we are losing from our economy. And when you factor in the impact that has on unemployment, on investment, on FDI, uh, there's, there's obviously a, an enormous impact on the country as a whole, on the socioeconomic status of the country. So I think there's a, there, there's a disconnect there. The second issue that we've got is a, an ideological one. Um, Mantashe is, is very, very much a communist. He comes from a, an ideological background that, that looks at state control of, of resources. And he believes that this needs to be held very, very closely and centrally. Um, the solution to, to South Africa's load shedding crisis is a distributed generation system with multiple sources of supply and with a strong uh, independent power producer backbone that can then um, that, that alleviates the, the, the single point of failure that we currently have from ESCOM. The thing that I find rather strange was having sat in a, a number of the budget, well, most of the budget speeches and in the lockup beforehand, in the last two, since Enoch Gorondwana has been the Minister of Finance, he has said we have moved away from trying to fix Eskom to trying to fix electricity supply. And yet it appears that the person who's charged with actually doing that has got a different agenda to not just uh, the Minister of Finance, but it appears also to the President. Uh, not just the President, the Minister of Finance, and, and basically every energy expert you talk to disagrees with, with uh, Minister Mantashe. I think that one of the challenges we have as a country is that we haven't been very progressive or forward thinking in our energy and electricity planning. We have an integrated resource plan that it took us 10 years to get a, an integrated resource plan. And it was only because we, we, and when I say we, I'm talking about opposition parties, I'm talking about myself and the Democratic Alliance, I'm talking about civil society, kicked up an enormous stink in, in 2017, 2018, 2019 about the lack of an integrated resource plan. Now, the, the IRP is South Africa's vision for electricity. It's the, the roadmap for, for our electricity future. Um, that we got one in October 2019, but almost the day that that was published by Minister Mantashe, it was out of date. It uses uh, assumptions that, that are absolutely ridiculous. I'll give you one example. It, it assumes an energy availability factor from ESCOM of 75%. So basically what that means is 75% of ESCOM's installed capacity will be generating at any given point. The reality is that ESCOM's generation uh, and energy availability factor is currently running in the mid to upper 50% range and has been for quite some time. It's been on a, a steady, steadily declining uh, trend for the last several years. And, and so the assumptions that we are basing our, our electricity modeling and planning on are outdated, and there doesn't seem to be any urgency from Minister Mantashe to update it. In that plan, he looks at uh, 1,500 megawatts of new generation from coal, that's not going to be forthcoming. He looks at 2,500 megawatts of generation coming from nuclear. That's a long way off. That's 15 years away. You know, the, these ideas are, are, are great in the long term, but our crisis is immediate and, and we need to address the immediacy of the, of, of the situation. Okay, so from a, a citizen of the country's perspective, we see that investment is not happening in South Africa because there's not just not uh, consistent power supply, but in many cases, you just can't get the power in the first place. So we're losing a lot of investment by South African companies and others who would be coming here. You've got a minister in place who is thinking weirdly, to say the least. You've got the hope of a 2024 election where the Rainbow Alliance, to call it uh, by the name that the Freedom Front is, is suggesting, that that Rainbow Coalition will come in, be business friendly, bring in economically sensible uh, policies. But we've still got 18 months until that happens. And in those 18 months, is there anything that can be done from someone like you, who is outside of, uh, uh, of, of Mantash, the guy who should know m more about this? on behalf of the public than anybody else? Or, or what can the public do to try and address something which at the moment just seems to be getting worse and worse? Sure. So a couple of things. First of all, I think that a lot 
will will rest on what happens at the ANC's elective conference this coming weekend, where if if uh, Ramaphosa's support declines or if there's any significant changes, he's going to have to have a cabinet reshuffle probably in January, uh, and he's probably going to have to have a cabinet reshuffle anyway. So there, there may well be a, an opportunity to move Mantashe out of mineral resources and energy, where he has been an absolute disaster from day one. So, so that's the first hopeful sign, and it's something that we obviously are pushing for quite strongly. In fact, I would prefer to see Mantashe out of cabinet completely. Uh, the second issue that we, we'd be looking at is, is obviously an early election. That's something that the DA has called for. We, we are of the opinion that uh, President Ramaphosa is rapidly losing the mandate of the country. The ANC is losing the mandate of the country and that we should have an early election and go to the polls and, and try and get that rainbow alliance in place uh, earlier rather than later. The, the other thing that we've got to do, and it's something that the DA is busy with where we govern, is we've got to try and free ourselves from, from over-reliance on ESCOM. So in the Western Cape, the provincial government has been working for a couple of years now on its municipal electricity reliance, uh, resilience program, municipal electricity resilience program, that's right, yeah, uh, where they are assisting municipalities to put in place their own generation, uh, to purchase from, from independent power producers, to uh, put in feed-in tariffs, and to uh, incentivize both domestic, commercial, and industrial uh, consumers and, 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 and uh, ratepayers to put their own embedded generation on the roofs of their houses uh, and, and premises and, and feed back into the municipal grid and so reduce the demand uh, overall. Um, we've seen initiatives like in, in Stellenbosch where they, they put uh, solar panels on, on the roofs of all the municipal buildings. Uh, in, in George, they, they've put uh, solar-powered streetlights uh, to make things safer when there's load sh shedding. Um, in in uh, other places, we've got... Uh, battery backups for traffic lights so that uh, road intersections are safer as well. All of these are initiatives that, that DA governments are putting in place to try and reduce the demand on ESCOM, make our country safer for, for uh, its citizens, and to attract foreign investment. And we, we're seeing it pay off because the Western Cape is streets ahead of the rest of the country when it comes to uh, investment, when it comes to unemployment, um, it, it's, it's, it's literally the best place in the country to live. And part of that is because we are doing so much to address the energy and electricity crisis. So ahead of the 2024 election, outside of the Western Cape, what can citizens do? So, uh, other metros where we govern, uh, Kuruleni is, has signed uh, 47 power purchase agreements with independent power producers. The city of Johannesburg has allocated 30% of its uh, operating budget to addressing some of the issues that it has with uh, city power and uh, its own internal distribution network, and then to also procuring additional generation capacity. Um, those are obviously two of the biggest metros in the country where we, we're taking steps to reduce reliance on, on, uh, on, elect uh, on ESCOM. But as a country, we need to be demanding more of government. Government needs to step up. You know, Cyril Ramaphosa announced in July this year his big interventions that he was going to going to put in place to address the electricity crisis. And he said that he was creating this National Electricity Crisis Committee and uh, Mantashe and Pravin Godan and Mondle Gonkubele were going to be on that committee and that that would then drive South Africa's electricity plan going forward. Well, the, the, the problem that we've seen or, or that has emerged is that nobody really knows what that electricity crisis committee is working on. It's, it's operating almost in the dark, pardon the pun, and they are, they are very much a secret organization that won't tell anyone what, what their key initiatives are, what the deadlines are, what the milestones are, what are we going to deliver and what progress have we made. We're six months down the line and we've seen very little out of that national electricity crisis committee. We need to see some concrete actions. We need to see some regulatory reform. We need to make it easier for uh, independent power producers, for businesses, for commercial and, and domestic uh, producers of electricity and, 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 and uh, residents and citizens to generate their own electricity, feed that into the, the grid where they have excess, but to reduce their reliance on, on ESCOM as well. So we need to see all of that. There's, there's a whole range of, 
of things that need to happen, but they need to start happening with urgency. In fact, they should be happening with urgency years ago. And one of the first steps, in your opinion anyway, from the timeline that I've uh, been reading through is change the minister of the department into somebody who actually is a little more <laughs> aligned with what's, what is happening around the world. Kevin Bilem is the DA's Shadow Minister of Minerals and Energy, and I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.